classical textbooks describe that symptoms in patients with entrapment neuropathies follow defined anatomical distributions. As such, we expect a dermatomal distribution in patients with radiculopathies and symptoms in the peripheral innervation territory in patients with carpal tunnel syndrome. However, up to two-thirds of patients present with symptoms that do not correlate with defined distributions. This may be explained by the large variability and significant overlap of dermatomes and innervation territories, as well as by symptoms originating from deeper structures, such as myotomes or sclerotomes, which may not coincide with superficial innervation territories. These mechanisms would not explain extensive spread of symptoms such as described by many patients. As an example, patients with carpal tunnel syndrome often report symptoms in a glove distribution, as well as proximal arm pain. Central sensitization with hyperexcitability of neurons at the level of the spinal cord or higher centers is often used as an explanation for spread of symptoms. Recent data suggests a contribution of remote immune inflammatory mechanisms to extraterritorial symptom spread. We have shown that experimental chronic sciatic nerve compression induces an immune inflammatory response at the level of the dorsal ganglia, far away from the site of the sciatic nerve lesion. Inside the dorsal ganglia are thousands and thousands of cell bodies of the peripheral sensory neurons. As you can imagine, it is very crowded within this small area, almost like the London subway at 5 p.m. Importantly, the neurons within a dorsal root ganglion originate from different sites in our extremities. If these neurons lie in an inflammatory environment, they will lower their firing thresholds and become hyperexcitable. This can lead to neuropathic pain behavior. So let's take the example of a patient with a tarsal tunnel syndrome, which affects the tibial nerve at the ankle. As per textbook, this syndrome should lead to symptoms in the tibial nerve territory of the foot, which means at the plantar sole. However, in some patients, the nerve injury at the ankle may induce a neuroinflammation at the level of the dorsal root ganglia. In this case, lumbar level L5, where most cell bodies of the tibial nerve are located. This means that all neurons in the dorsal ganglion L5 will lower their firing threshold, meaning that they become hyperexcitable. If that happens in nociceptors and the brain interprets it as relevant, this may result in a pain experience. The issue is that we do not only have tibial neurons within L5 dorsal ganglia, but there are also neurons from the perineal, sural and sciatic nerve traveling through this ganglion. If these neurons become hyperexcitable, it may well lead to spread of symptoms well outside the affected tibial nerve territory. As such, widespread symptoms may be attributed to peripheral mechanisms, as the dorsal root ganglia are still part of the peripheral nervous system. But of course, central mechanisms such as central sensitization may also account for the commonly encountered spread of symptoms. It has also been shown that severe nerve injuries may induce neuroinflammation with activation of glial cells at the level of the spinal cord or higher pain centers. This immune inflammation may even spread to contralateral dorsal root ganglia or dorsal horns of the spinal cord, which may then explain the occurrence of mirror pain. Interestingly, Many patients with carpal tunnel syndrome have bilateral symptoms, which often disappear following unilateral surgery. In summary, when diagnosing a patient with suspected peripheral compression neuropathy, we should not rely purely on symptom distribution, simply because the majority of patients will have symptoms that do not follow correct anatomical boundaries. It remains important to examine a patient within a comprehensive clinical reasoning framework, including a thorough history and neurological examination.